In the early 1960s, a group of young German filmmakers, inspired by the French New Wave, wrote the Oberhausen Manifesto, which declared, quote, The old cinema is dead. We believe in the new, unquote. These filmmakers were fiercely independent, and they believed film to be an artistic medium rather than a commercial endeavor. They gave new life to the auteur theory of film, the idea that a film can be made out of the singular vision of its director rather than the collaboration of an overriding studio or production company. Thus was born the new German cinema, out of which sprang many international filmmaking icons including Werner Herzog, Wolfgang Petersen, and Wim Wenders. Wenders made a name for himself in the mid-70s with his so-called road movie trilogy, Alice in the Cities, The Wrong Move, and Kings of the Road, all three of which received critical success and are still highly regarded by film buffs today. However, it wasn't until his 1984 road film Paris, Texas that Wim Wenders found true international success, which he would follow up with the equally acclaimed Wings of Desire. Long after the era of new German cinema had come to a close, Wenders was at the top of his game, a true international auteur, and in 1991, he released what he called the ultimate road movie. This woman has just been in a car accident with two bank robbers. When one of the robbers is forced to recuperate in a local hotel, she agrees to take their money to a secure location where it can be protected from the police. Along the way, she meets another fugitive with a bevy of bizarre secrets, and against the wishes of her ex-boyfriend, she uses some of the stolen money to track the mysterious stranger across the globe, ultimately landing in Australia where she joins a wild scientific experiment involving visual mind-reading technology and its unexpected capacity to record and play back human dreams. Once she sees her own nocturnal playground, though, her sanity is shaken by an extreme obsession, and it is only her ex-boyfriend who can pull her back from the brink of a permanent disconnection from reality. Before we go any further, if you could please hit that like button, we might finally be able to stop chasing the elusive YouTube algorithm. If you really do like this video, please subscribe as well. Thank you in advance. With that out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. In Christmas of 1977, Wim Wenders found himself spending a few months in Australia, where he was taken with the stark natural beauty of the land and the cultural beliefs of First Nation Australians, specifically the spiritual ideas of the dreaming and songlines. I can't claim to be an expert on indigenous Australian culture, and I know just enough to know that I'd probably get into trouble if I tried to explain it too much. Broadly speaking, though, the First Nation Australians teach that their distant ancestors traversed the land during its creation, and that there is still a continuous process of creation which must be reinforced by so-called songlines. Songlines are oral histories that are sung in sequence to track the paths of the ancestors and creators, literally describing the character of specific geological areas that connect the people with the land. What's he singing? He's singing the country. Wim Wenders naturally recontextualized these ideas in his own way, and he saw the potential to write a story about people traversing the globe in a path of spiritual creation as the world around them is threatened with apocalyptic destruction. We're on the eve of destruction, and all I give a damn about is laughing, drinking, carousing. Ending with the last images of humanity being preserved in an isolated haven within the Australian desert. It only made sense for it to be a road movie, so he later combined it with a separate idea involving a modern retelling of the Odyssey, in which Penelope, tired of waiting for Odysseus's return, sets out to find him. The combined project would prove to be too ambitious for the low-budget filmmaker at that point in his career, 
But after his successes in the 80s, he was finally able to secure about $20 million of funding from America, France, Japan, and Australia. Though the script was continually evolving throughout the production, the initial drafts took inspiration from the semi-fictional book The Songlines by Bruce Chatwin, and the dystopian In the Country of Last Things by Paul Auster. Venders formulated the story with the help of his girlfriend at the time, Solveig Delmartin, an actress who plays the lead, Claire, and who had previously worked with Venders on Wings of Desire. In the beginning, he brought in fellow filmmaker Michael Almereda, who wrote the first draft a few years before he could make Cherry 2000. And then, in 1988, the novelist Peter Carey helped Venders rework the entire story and would ultimately receive the majority of the writing credit. In addition to Domarthen as Claire, and after failing to secure Willem Dafoe, Venders cast William Hurt as the male lead, the elusive Sam Farber. Next came New Zealander Sam Neill as Claire's ex-boyfriend Eugene. Neil, despite losing out to Timothy Dalton as the new James Bond, My friends call me Bond. James Bond. was on the cusp of stardom, fresh off a memorable supporting role in The Hunt for Red October, and a few years before hitting the mainstream with Jurassic Park. Another key role was that of Sam's father, the visionary rogue scientist Henry Farber. Vendors sought the likes of Robert Mitchum, Richard Widmark, and Gregory Peck for the part, but ultimately landed the great Max von Sydow, known for dozens of famous roles including Jesus in The Greatest Story Ever Told, the titular Exorcist, and Ming the Merciless in 1980's Flash Gordon. Other notable actors include Bond girl Lois Childs as Elsa, who is clearly framed in this scene as an homage to Vermeer's Girl with a Pearl Earring, famous indigenous Australian actor David Golpelil as David, Vendor's regular Rudiger Vogler as Philip, the French singer and actor Eddie Mitchell as Raymond, the legendary Jean Miro as Sam's mother Edith, and the prolific Japanese greats Kuniko Miyaki and Chisu Ryu in two of their final roles as the couple that offers Sam and Claire refuge while in Japan. Filming on Until the End of the World began in April of 1990, and went for roughly nine months, with shooting done in at least 11 different countries and four continents, with the biggest chunk of the movie filmed in Australia's Northern Territory. Vendors utilized a small core crew that was supported by different local production outfits in each location, and with Vendors' vision in constant flux, it was reportedly an exhausting, but also exhilarating shoot. One of the most notable technological aspects of the film is its use and manipulation of digital HD video, something that had never been used in any feature film before, seeing as how it barely even existed at the time. With the help of the Japanese Broadcasting Corporation, NHK, Vendors and the technician Sean Naughton were able to digitize film footage into HD and manipulate it in novel ways, trying to predict the kinds of digital noise that would naturally spring from the bleeding-edge technology. This footage, simultaneously high-def and wildly distorted, was used primarily for the dream images late in the film, and a lot of that footage came from Vendors' own childhood home movies, to lend them an air of intimacy and honesty he felt he couldn't get from anything made deliberately. For the soundtrack, Vendors contacted well over a dozen of his favorite musical artists and bands, and asked them to write songs in the style they imagined themselves working in around the turn of the century. Among the bands that agreed were The Talking Heads, Peter Gabriel, Depeche Mode, Lou Reed, R.E.M., Elvis Costello, and Nick Cave and the Bad Seeds. While most of the songs that made their way onto the soundtrack are great and even a bit famous, for example, Jane Sibbery's Calling All Angels is probably her most well-known song, the one song that stands out is the title track by U2, which was released on their ultra-successful octuple platinum album Octung Baby. U2's Until the End of the World is named after the film, not the other way around, and was created after the band met with vendors about the project. While it has its roots in an old, unused guitar riff in the band's back catalog, and while the lyrics are about a conversation between Jesus and Judas Iscariot, the song was, in fact, made for the film, and by my count, it appears at least three separate times in the film's final version. Just on a personal note, it has always been one of my favorite U2 tracks. With a score by Graham Ravel, the soundtrack for Until the End of the World proved far more successful than the film itself, and there's no doubt a bunch of people only discovered the film through the soundtrack, which had a respectable chart on the US Billboard 200. 
Depending on who you ask, the first rough cut of the film came in at anywhere from 12 to 20 hours, which was much more than the two and a half hour maximum vendors had contractually agreed to. He managed to cut it down to roughly four and a half hours, which he considered the shortest possible length for his film, but the producers balked at the idea of trying to release such a long movie, even rejecting Vendors' pleas to release it as two films. Faced with the prospect of having to trim nearly half the completed film, Vendors made the expensive choice to make a full copy of the film's negatives, which he funded himself, and later edit them in secret to the nearly five-hour version that this review is based on. Before he could do that, though, and rather than letting the producers cut the film themselves, he and his editor hacked apart until the end of the world into what Vendors not so affectionately refers to as the Reader's Digest versions, which came in at 158 minutes for the US release and 179 for Europe. It was in those forms that Until the End of the World released in the closing months of 1991, to negative reviews and a dismal worldwide box office total of $830,000, well short of its $20 million budget. It's the end of the world. It was a bomb that would have been relegated to permanent obscurity, only seen by a handful of film buffs like myself, if not for Vendors' foresight in making an extended director's cut, which was fairly uncommon back in 1991. Vendors took this version to various film festivals throughout the years, where it received far more critical acclaim than the shorter cuts. Various other versions were released, including a nearly complete one that was released as a trilogy of films in Japan, before Vendors himself oversaw a 4K digital restoration from the original negative. The longest cut now available, at a whopping 287 minutes, this digitally restored version was only released for home viewing in 2019 by the Criterion Collection. While it has managed over the years to carve out a niche of critical support and underground fame, the film remains criminally underappreciated and obscure, having never quite shaken off its reputation as one of the biggest bombs in the history of independent cinema. And that's why I'm making this video. To be fair, it can be difficult to sit through the five hours of Vendors' complete vision, and it does, in places, feel a bit slower than it needs to be, especially if you try to watch it all in one sitting. It does genuinely feel like two movies that happen to share the same characters, and perhaps it would be best experienced by newcomers in two chunks, separated at the point in which our characters arrive in Australia. That disclaimed, this is a remarkable film that deserves a far greater audience, and I've been mildly obsessed with it for decades, even though my first exposure was to the butchered US theatrical release. It has the spark and energy of an independent film, where you're never quite sure where it's going until it gets there, but it also does great things with its big budget and globe-trotting location shooting. The acting is wonderful, with one or two exceptions, the characters are endearing, the world-building is profound, the cinematography is beautiful, the music is astonishing, and the story is filled to the brim with deep themes about spirituality and the nature of art itself without getting bogged down by too much pretentiousness to fail at being entertaining on its own merits. I admit I find the first half more entertaining than the second, with its film noir-esque story of a manhunt across international borders, a love triangle driven almost entirely by obsession, an ironically hapless detective, a bag full of money, and a compelling mystery that hints at the science fiction to come. However, it is nowhere near as thematically interesting as the second half, which takes a sharp right turn into sci-fi philosophy, indigenous Australian culture, and the nature of storytelling, with a bonus theme about the transcendent quality of music. Late in the story, when the lead characters find themselves caught in a downward spiral of addiction to their own dream images, the film borders on a critique of its own medium, arguing quite convincingly that there is no substitute for the raw experience of reality. The narration, which I happen to think is necessary for this film, even though I almost never say such a thing about voiceovers, hammers this home in the end when Eugene, our narrator, explains that he wants to write a happy ending, but must be true to what, quote, really happened, unquote. And the ending of the film does feel more genuine than a more traditional Hollywood conclusion would. Of course, both endings are actually fictional, since the film is a work of fiction, 
but I am always drawn to meta-storytelling of this kind that seeks to explore the boundaries between the world we perceive and the stories we tell, which is something this film does really well. As science fiction goes, Until the End of the World is also startlingly prescient in its predictions for the millennium. This movie, which I remind you was made in 1990, contains handheld telecommunication devices, GPS road navigation complete with voice instructions, flash-like storage devices, an internet search engine, and several other things that are so commonplace today it's easy to forget how bizarre they would have seemed 30 years ago. So, while the number of people who actually know about this movie is far too small, though hopefully this video is making it slightly larger, I will continue singing its praises alongside its most ardent fans. For this reason, and in my book, Until the End of the World will always be a sci-fi classic. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. Do you think there is an upper limit to how long a feature film should be? Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and while you're there, don't forget to like and subscribe if you haven't already. If you'd like to support what I do even more, consider becoming a patron to get access to bonus content, vote on future topics, and more. You can also check out my debut novel, Paradox, available at Amazon.com, and my podcast, The Streaming Heap, available wherever you get your podcasts. Links for those are in the description, and can also be found at my website at emagill.com, where you can find written reviews of plenty more sci-fi classics in both film and literature. Until next time, though, when we'll go back about 40 years and then go back 40 more, this is the Unapologetic Geek telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody. Majestic, what a fantastic, my people, plastic America. <laughs>